That, that's actually the right way to understand it. Uh, people have a tough time uh, understanding gold. Uh, a lot of people think of it as a commodity, uh, which it really isn't. I mean, I know it trades on the commodity exchange that's included in the commodity indices, but a commodity is a, a generic input to other processes or, um, or, or products. Uh, and gold really isn't. I mean, gold is very useful as money, but it's not used for much else. People say, well, gold is used as jewelry. Sure, but jewelry is wearable wealth. When people buy a gold necklace or a gold bracelet or earrings or whatever, they think they're uh, basically buying something that will retain its value. And no better example of that than an Indian bride who is adorned in gold necklaces. But that's uh, those, those are the family savings. Uh, that's their inheritance for their children. So uh, to me, uh, ju gold jewelry is just wearable wealth, but it's still a form of wealth. And of course, coins, bars, ingots, and so forth are, are just pure wealth. So gold functions well as money. It's not good for much else, so I don't think of it as a commodity. Um, as far as an investment is concerned, I don't really think of gold as an investment. I, it does have a place in investor portfolios, as I explained in my book, The New Case for Gold, but um, it doesn't have any yield. And of course, that's often cited as a criticism, famously by Warren Buffett. He said, why would you have gold? It has no yield. Of course, Buffett's the king of tax deferred compounding. But um, gold has no yield because it's not supposed to have a yield. In other words, money has no yield because it has no risk. If you reach in your wallet or your purse and pull out a dollar bill and hold it up with both hands in front of you and say, does it have a yield? The answer is no, it has no yield at all uh, because it's not supposed to. Uh, if you have a Bitcoin, does Bitcoin have a yield? No, it's a, it's a Bitcoin. A dollar is a dollar, a Bitcoin is a Bitcoin. An ounce of gold is an ounce of gold, but none of them have yield because they're not supposed to because they're money. If you want yield, you have to take some risk. Now people say, oh, I can take my dollar and put it in the bank and get a little something, you know, not much these days, but a little bit of yield. Well, that's fine, but now it's not money anymore. Now the, the Federal Reserve will tell you it's money. They count it as the money supply. But what, when you have a bank deposit, you're really just an unsecured creditor of a private bank, which uh, as recently as 2008 were insolvent institutions. Of course, they were bailed out by the Fed. We all know that, but um, it's not risk-free. I mean, the bank could fail, and people say, well, I have deposit insurance, but for large accounts, wealthy individuals, corporations, your deposit may very well be in excess of the insured amount. Even if it isn't, the, the deposit insurance corporation itself could fail. Um, the, uh, there could be uh, a panic where they closed the banks. Uh, that happened uh, in 1933 in the United States or where they reprogram ATMs to limit you to say $300 a day in gas and groceries because who needs more than $300 a day for gas and groceries. Now, so it, um, these may be low risks. I'm not saying any of these things are going to happen tomorrow, but they're not zero risk. But, you know, the dollar bill in your wallet, the, the ounce of gold in, in a safe place, the Bitcoin in your digital wallet, those are all, uh, th those don't have any um, uh, investment risk associated with them. So, so saying gold is money um, solves a lot of problems. It, it, it's, it's also money is a unit of account. It's a way of measuring other things. Uh, and that is the best way to think about money. A lot of uh, the criticisms of gold just sort of fall down or go away once you say, well, it's not a commodity, it's not an investment, it's money, and then go from there to think about what value that might have in your portfolio. Now, there are some people that make the argument that there's not enough gold to support finance and commerce for today. Uh, there's just not enough out there. Is there enough gold to support? Yeah, there's always enough gold. That's, that's a nonsense argument. And by the way, in my book, uh, The mm -hmm. New Case for Gold, um, most of the book is devoted to explaining uh, the value of gold, reasons to have gold in a portfolio, uh, the possible gold standard, etc. But at the beginning of the book, in the introduction, I felt it was important to knock down these arguments because there's seven or eight arguments that you hear over and over again. You know, gold is a barbarous relic. There's not enough gold to support world trade and finance. The gold supply does not grow fast enough to keep up with the growth of the global economy. They're all nonsense, and I explain why in the book. But let's just, to be specific, let's take the one you mentioned, Dave, which is okay. there's not enough gold to support um, you know, world trade and finance. Well, there's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. Now, if you take the amount of official gold in the world at uh, $1,200 an ounce and just multiply the, the weight in ounces by $1,200, that... Uh, result is not enough to uh, to support all the money supply without severe deflationary consequences. But if gold were revalued to say ten thousand dollars an ounce, the same amount of gold 
at ten thousand dollars an ounce would would support a much larger uh, quantity of trade and finance very comfortably, and at even higher gold prices, um, it could do that with ease, including broader definitions of money supply such as M two. And so the the short answer is there's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. Now it is true that if you want to have a gold standard to use gold as a reference in the monetary system, if you get the price wrong it can have very severe deflationary consequences. And there was no better example of that than 1925, after World War I, when the UK wanted to go back to the gold standard. Um, and the question arose, you know, Winston Churchill was the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time. Uh, John Maynard Keynes was uh, one of the, the Exchequer's and Bank of England advisors. And the question arose, well, if we go back to a strict gold standard, what should the price of gold be? And Churchill felt sort of duty-bound or honor-bound to go back to the pre-World War I price. The problem was the UK had double money supply to fight World War I. They basically printed a lot of money to fight the war, which is not unusual. A war of that type is an existential risk, and you do what you have to do to survive. But when you double the money supply and keep the price of gold pegged, um, then that one of two things has to happen. You either have to, if you want to repeg at the new level, you either have to, say, double the price of gold or cut the money supply in half. So by going to the old price, the UK had to cut the money supply in half, which was highly deflationary. So the, the, the point is, if you have a gold standard, there's always enough gold to support it, but you have to get the price right. Today, uh, given the amount of gold in the world, given the amount of uh, money supply in the world, um, and the leverage behind that, uh, I've, I've actually done the math, and I take the reader through this in the book, the implied non-deflationary price of gold to have a gold standard today would be uh, at the low end ten thousand dollars an ounce, at the high end fifty thousand dollars an ounce. You know, the, the 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 range varies depending on what's your definition of money supply. Are you going to use M zero, M one, M two? How much gold backing do you want to have? Do you want to have twenty percent, forty percent, a hundred percent? Who's going to be in the group? Is it just the United States? Is it all the major economies in the world? Those are important policy decisions, and you have to answer those questions one by one. But when you answer the questions and do the math, the range, as I said, is $10,000 to $50,000 now. So when I mention numbers like that, they're not you know, made up numbers. I'm not picking a big number just to get headlines to get attention. That's the actual price you would have to have in order to have a gold standard and avoid deflation. So the short answer is there's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. So when people say there's not enough gold, they actually don't know what they're talking about there. They haven't really thought through the problem the way I just described. Now, you mentioned $10,000 on that gold. I mean, we've seen gold drop considerably. Uh, it had a little bounce back a little while ago. Uh, and we're actually nowhere near 10000 Why do you think it's going to reach 10000 And when do you think it's going to reach 10000 Well, we're nowhere near 10000 because we're not on a gold standard and we're not using gold as a as a reference for a store of value. Now, people can do this personally. Um, I recommend to people, uh, you know, don't wait for a central banks to go on a gold standard. You can go on a personal gold standard today by allocating part of your portfolio to gold, which is a very good way to preserve wealth. Um, no, but I agree. Uh, if uh, I'm not saying that central banks have to go to a gold standard. What I am saying is that they might go to a gold standard if there's a collapse of confidence in paper money uh, in fiat currencies, which history says is just a matter of time. Uh, when I talk about the, uh, the uh, collapse of the international monetary system, that's something that has happened three times in the past hundred years. It happened in 1914, it happened in 1939, it happened again in 1971. It seems to happen every 30 or 40 years. It's been uh, over 40 years since the last time. That does not mean the international monetary system will collapse tomorrow. It just means that nobody should be surprised if it does. Um, and when the international monetary system collapses, which it will, um, it doesn't mean the end of the world. It doesn't mean we all go live in caves and eat canned goods. What it does mean is that the major financial and trading powers have to come together, sit down around a table, and reform or reboot, if you will, the, what they call the rules of the game, uh, the rules of the international monetary system. And so what will those new rules be? Well, uh, if, if you do this because um, the citizens around the world have lost confidence in fiat money, uh, are you going to have more fiat money? Are you going to have... Uh, say world money, which are the uh, which already exists, by the way. That's the International Monetary Fund or the IMF has a kind of world money. They call it the Special Drawing Right or SDR, and it's just printed money, but it's printed by somebody else. It's printed by the IMF. They could print trillions of SDRs, and 
flood the world with that and uh, kind of reflate the economy the way the Fed did with dollars in 2009 and you know later with QE1, QE2, QE3. But it begs the question, you know, if people, if you're doing that because people have lost confidence in one form of fiat money, why would they have confidence in another form of fiat money? It might work if, uh, because nobody understands it, but it's actually not that technical, not that hard to understand. Um, more likely it would fail. And at that point, I agree that there's not a central bank in the world that wants a gold standard, but they may have to go to a gold standard, not because they want to, but because they have to, to restore confidence. And if that happens, then you do get, uh, I mean, the you know, central bankers are smart enough to understand the math that I just took people through. And if you say, okay, let's not make the mistake of 1925, let's use gold as a reference, and let's get the price right so it's non-deflationary, that's how you get to $10,000 gold. You mentioned going on a gold standard, and we see other countries out there like China, they're purchasing a huge amount of gold. And of course, they don't report everything that they're purchasing. They hide a lot of it. Uh, why do you think they're purchasing so much gold at this point? Well, the way I put it to people, they're either stupid or they see something coming that most people don't. Well, I have a lot of friends in China. I visit there. I've been to Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Xi'an, and Shangsheng. I've been all over China. They're not stupid. Uh, they know exactly what's going on. And so, therefore, they see something coming that most people don't see, which is either inflation or a collapse of the international monetary system. Either one would be very bad for holders of dollar assets. Now, China, uh, until recently, had four, approximately $4 trillion in reserves. Um, but they've lost over 20% of that in the past 15 months. They're now down to about $3.2 trillion. They've lost uh, over $800 billion of reserves. Um, but they still have quite a bit, $3.2 trillion, of which uh, about $2 trillion is U.S. dollar denominated, and over more than half of that uh, consists of U.S. Treasury securities and other forms of government securities. So they are extremely exposed to the dollar. Um, the uh, A lot of people think China has a secret plan to buy gold and, and make the yuan a gold-backed global reserve currency and run the dollar off the road. It's an interesting scenario. It's actually a scenario I played out um, in a war game we did for the Pentagon uh, at a top secret weapons laboratory in 2009. Um, it's, it's a scenario well worth considering, but it's not the most likely scenario. Um, the most likely scenario is that China knows that they can't dump their dollars. I mean, they're very vulnerable to U.S. inflation. The U.S. is good at inflation. Uh, we have a very difficult time uh, doing it lately, but um, they'll get there eventually because that's how we get out from under our enormous debt. Um, you pay back people with the amount of dollars you owe them, but the dollars aren't worth very much as the result of inflation. So it's as if to say, you know, we, we turn to China and say, hey, here's here's the trillion dollars we owe you, uh, good luck buying a loaf of bread because we've inflated away the value of the currency. So China knows that. They can't dump them because uh, you know, the treasury market's big, but it's not that big. It cannot absorb that much selling. If that kind of dumping were considered malicious, the president could stop it. The president has emergency powers to stop it. China would be shooting itself in, in the foot to some extent because by selling, they would be depressing the price of everything else they still have on the books. So they won't do that and they can't do that. But what they can do is diversify into gold. And now you have a kind of hedge position. So you sit there with a big pile of treasury notes and a big pile of gold. And you say, okay, we hope the dollar is stable, in which case not much would happen to the gold. And we get paid all this money you owe us. But if you Americans try to inflate the value away, which we think you will, and they're probably right about that, they'll lose money on the treasuries, but they'll make money on the gold because uh, we all know what gold will do in inflation. So so they're actually just creating a, a hedge position, which is very prudent. And my advice to investors is, why don't you do the same thing? James, China's going to start the yuan-based gold price fix in April. Do you think this is going to be uh, a game changer in the precious metals market? Uh, not really. I think it's a good development. I think it's positive to have competition. I think it's positive to have more than one center of gold trading. Uh, of course, you're not going to see radically different prices in Shanghai and New York. I mean, the COMEX will have a dollar price. The Chinese will have a yuan price. There'll be some cross rate between yuan and dollars. Uh, that the banks will trade and anybody with uh, even rudimentary knowledge of arbitrage will just look at those three factors, the yuan dollar cost rate, the Shanghai yuan price, the New York dollar price, and the arbitrage will see to it that those prices stay roughly in line. But what it does do by creating creating the arbitrage, it will make COMEX a little more honest uh, because if the price gets um, 
uh, you know, a little, uh, you know, goes up a little bit in Shanghai. You'll just sell Shanghai, buy COMEX, uh, profit the arbitrage, uh, keep the arbitrage profit, and that'll make it harder to suppress the price on COMEX. Now, having said that, uh, I'm not completely uh, confident that uh, Shanghai will be untainted by manipulation because remember the Chinese government is still buying more gold. They don't have enough gold. They've, they've acquired thousands of tons. They've come up from almost nowhere to uh, currently they admit to having about 1,700 tons of gold, official gold. Uh, the truth is, as you mentioned, Dave, they have a lot more than that. Um, no one knows exactly how much more. It's a state secret, but we do have pretty good information from Hong Kong imports, um, uh, mining output, from other independent sources to estimate how much official gold China has. And it's probably closer to, let's say, 4,000 tons. That would be an estimate, um, maybe a little bit higher than that. But of course, they've got to get to 8,000 tons in order to uh, look the U.S. in the eye. Uh, you know, if you think of, uh, I, I said earlier about the, um, the collapse of the monetary system resulting in a, a new Bretton Woods type conference where people get together and rewrite the rules of the game. Well, think of that as a poker game where you, you sit down in a poker game. What do you want? You want a big pile of chips. Well, in this game, gold are the chips. And uh, the U.S. has the biggest pile, about 8,000 tons, and China's trying to catch up. So if China's out to buy another 3,000 tons, and all the evidence indicates that they are, they don't want a higher price. They want a lower price. If you were out to buy 3,000 tons of gold, you'd want a lower price. Now, the price of gold is going to skyrocket, ultimately, for the reasons I explained. But not yet, not right away. And so, um, so China might um, you know, intervene or manipulate the Shanghai Gold Exchange, as they could and probably do in COMEX, to keep the price from getting from spinning out of control upwards in a disorderly way uh, until until their buying program is complete. But once it's complete, sooner, sooner than later, they'll have um, uh, they'll be protected, and then it's kind of on the United States. And the U.S. is trapped uh, if we don't deflate. Uh, our debt load is non-sustainable. Um, if we and then people run to gold as a safe haven. If we do inflate, um, I'm sorry. When I said if we if we don't inflate, the debt load is non-sustainable. If we do inflate, uh, the price of gold will skyrocket as inflation hedge. So gold wins either way. Uh, and it's it's again it's like a chess game where China and the U.S. are moving the pieces around the board, but uh, getting a big enough pile of gold puts the United States in check. China and Russia, uh, for the last couple of years, they've been duplicating a lot of what we have here in the West, like the SWIFT payment system. They've been dealing uh, using their own currency. They're bypassing the dollar. Are China and Russia trying to end the dollar or do away with it? Or what are they? what's their main objective here? I think their motives are, are mixed. Uh, China is trying to do two things. One, they're acquiring gold for strategic reasons. Uh, but the other reason is, as I mentioned, to diversify their portfolio to give them a hedge against inflation. In the case of Russia, they don't have as much exposure to the dollar. I mean, the U.S. is in a financial war with Russia, uh, stemming from the uh, Russian um, invasion of Crimea and their incursions in eastern Ukraine. The U.S. threw financial sanctions on them. Nobody thought it was wise to you know, drop the 82nd Airborne into Sevastopol and Crimea. Uh, nobody won a shooting war, but the president uh, more or less declared a financial war. Um, and so we have sanctions sort of flying back and forth between Russia and the United States. Now, uh, Russia is trying to immunize itself from vulnerability there, so they want to reduce their dollar assets and acquire more assets in euros, um, or for that matter, Chinese yuan or, or other currencies of their trading partners, which they're doing. But the other thing they're doing very aggressively is buying gold. Uh, look, physical gold, uh, the U.S. cannot freeze it. Um, you cannot interdict it. You cannot hack it. You cannot erase it. It's really invulnerable to all the kinds of cyber financial warfare that are going on behind the scenes. So Russia's reasons are more strategic. I don't think either Russia or China are planning to destroy the dollar in the short run. But, you know, we might destroy the dollar ourselves with uh, Fed policy and money printing. Uh, yeah, I, I do a lot of threat finance. I do work for the United States government, the intelligence community, the Defense Department. And, um, you know, we work on what we call threat finance and uh, basically financial threats from other powers. And I always uh, tell people at the, at the Pentagon and elsewhere, uh, I said, look, the, the greatest threats to the dollar don't come from Russia and China. They come from the Fed and the Treasury. We're our own worst enemy. But um, but these things can uh, emerge spontaneously. They can spin out of control. Uh, you can be surprised, as people have been time and time again. So Russia's 
I think very prudently, stocking up on gold and saying, okay, we're going to get out of that game. We're going to play our own game. We're going to have a store of value for our reserves that the United States cannot uh, erase or interdict or freeze. Now, lately we've been hearing a lot of talk about cashless society. I mean, we hear negative interest rates. Europe has negative interest rates. Japan, of course, here in the U.S., they increased the interest rates by 25 basis point. But Larry Summers and others have been talking about getting rid of cash, getting rid of the $100 bill, getting rid of um, the 500 uh, euro note. Why is there such a push for a cashless society today? Well, it's like saying uh, if I want to slaughter a bunch of pigs, why would I round them up and put them in a, in a, a pen outside the slaughterhouse? The answer is if you want to uh, steal money from people or disadvantage people, you need to herd them into – uh, you know, a couple pens, uh, again, as I say, by the slaughterhouse. So what they want is they want all the wealth, uh, all the savings concentrated in four or five big banks in digital form. Then the United States can uh, impose negative interest rates as other countries around the world, Europe, uh, Sweden, Japan, Switzerland, all have negative rates today. So this is not something uh, unusual or theoretically impossible. It's actually happening. But if I'm going to impose negative interest rates, the easiest way to get around that is for um, someone to just go to the bank, get their money out and stick it in a, in a coffee can and bury it in the backyard or stick it under a mattress, which people did do during the Great Depression. I think those talk to your grandmother about that and they'll, they'll tell you, you'll hear stories like that pretty readily. So let's say um, you and I each have $100,000. You put your $100,000 in the bank. I take my $100,000 out in cash. Uh, a year later, in a world of 1% negative interest rates, you only have $99,000 because your interest rate was negative one. Uh, but I still have the $100,000. So cash is an easy way to beat negative interest rates. But governments want negative interest rates uh, as a form of taxation and also to force people to spend. It's like, hey, I'm going to take your money, so why don't you go spend it to create what Keynesians call aggregate demand, uh, also to create negative real rates, which is a condition under which most investment projects even poorly considered ones make economic sense because if the bank's paying you to be a borrower, why not borrow some money and go spend it or invest it? So that's the, the, the theory behind negative rates. It's pretty badly flawed. Actually, the theory is wrong, but that's what the, uh, the PhD types believe. But uh, as a consumer investor saver, uh, when you come after me with negative rates, I just say, well, I'll just take the cash out of the bank and I'll have my cash a year from now. So you have to get rid of cash in order to stop that from happening. Now, what I say is people, um, people say, you know, I'm worried about the war on cash. And I just say, well, don't worry about it. It's over. The government won. Uh, because if you think you can go down to the bank and get twenty, thirty thousand dollars of cash, uh, hassle free, guess again, you will be treated like today. I'm not talking about some future regime, but uh, today you'll be treated like a drug dealer, a terrorist, a tax evader. Um, you, you go to certain banks, and uh, it's perfectly legal, by the way. There's nothing illegal about going to get cash, but you will be treated like a criminal. You'll be asked to uh, fill out all kinds of forms, provide all kinds of identification. Give reasons. Some banks will say, well, uh, you know, come back a couple of days from now, we'll have the cash. So you sort of get your cash by appointment. They'll file uh, CTRs, which are currency transaction reports, or even for amounts below $10,000. Uh, that's the threshold for a CTR. They'll file, file what they call an SAR, suspicious activity reports. Again, you're a perfectly innocent citizen trying to get some cash, but you'll be treated suspiciously uh, because the banks have all been uh, terrorized by fines and penalties under any money laundering regimes um, and the, the bank clerks have been trained, you know, if you don't uh, file the right reports or ask the right questions, it'll cost you your job. So they have no motivation to, to cut anybody any slack. Um, and so, the, as I said, the war on cash is already over. I mean, just think about it in your own life, my life, I'm no different, you know. You have a credit card, you have a debit card, if somebody owes you money, they probably wire it to you. If you have a job, you probably get direct pay. Um, you probably pay your bills online. Um, it's all very convenient. We probably don't have much cash in our pockets, but, um, but try getting some. You'll find it's harder than you think. For my last question, are, are we getting closer to a collapse of the international monetary system? Sure. I mean, as I said, the, the monetary system has, co the international monetary system has collapsed three times in the past hundred years, as I mentioned, 1914, 1939. 1971. It does seem to happen every 35, 40 years or so. Uh, we're certainly getting closer by the day, but it's not just speculation on my part. I mean, just for example, and let's make this very concrete. What did we hear about in 2008? Too big to fail, too big to fail, too big to fail. Well, guess what? Since 2008, the five biggest banks in the United States are bigger. They control a larger percentage of the total banking assets in the United States. Their derivatives books are much bigger. 
and I study um, uh, international. I study risk in um, capital markets, and international monetary systems, not through uh, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, which the uh, PhDs use, but using complexity theory, behavioral economics, um, Bayes' theorem, inverse probability, and other scientific methods that are much more robust and much more uh, have much greater explanatory power. So when you do that, you find that these me mega banks not only are bigger, but they're they're densely connected. Uh, the density function is quite uh, quite high, and in that type of situation, you can have what are called emergent properties, surprise shocks, but the risk goes up exponentially. Meaning, uh, let's say I, I'm a bank, let's say I'm JP Morgan, and I triple the size of my balance sheet. And you go to Jamie Dimon and say, you know, Mr. Dimon, you've tripled your balance sheet, how much did the risk go up? And he would say, well, very little because, you know, we tripled it, but it's long, short, long, short, long, short, and all those things pair off and net, net, net out, and the net risk is actually quite low, so the risk went up very little. Uh, if you ask my 85-year-old uh, mother, who's quite bright but not an economist, uh, I say, Mom, you know, you tripled the balance sheet. How much did the risk go up? She would probably use intuition and say, well, it went up three times, you know. So uh, three times is uh, tri triple the size, you triple the risk. Jamie Dimon's wrong. My mother's wrong. Uh, when you triple the size of the balance sheet, you increase the risk by a factor exponentially. It could be 10 times or 100 times, um, et cetera, because... Uh, when you have a financial panic, see, going back to Jamie Dimon's explanation, he said all this stuff net outs. Well, it, it, nets, it net, net, nets out. It nets out when nothing's going wrong. Uh, but when there's a financial panic and everybody wants their money back, all of a sudden the risk is not in the net, it's in the gross. If you're my counterparty and you owe me a gross amount and you're going out of business, I'm not going to lose the net amount on my books. I'm going to I'm going to lose the gross amount that I have out to you, and I'm not going to be able to cover it in the marketplace because uh, because there is a financial panic going on, and you're going to find that people don't want to transact that business. And so the risk is in the gross, and complexity theory tells us that as you increase the scale or size of a system, a power curve will show you that the risk goes up exponentially. The worst thing that can happen in a system is an exponential function. So for all those reasons. The, the system is more vulnerable, far more vulnerable, exponentially more vulnerable today than it was in 2008. So we're just waiting for the snowflake to start the avalanche. We're just waiting for a catalyst. And for that, go back and look at just recent history, 1987, October 1987. The stock market fell 22% in one day. Uh, 1994, the Mexican peso crisis. 1997, 98, the Asian financial crisis, long-term capital management markets, global markets were hours away from shutting down completely. And I know that because I was general counsel of long-term capital management. I negotiated the bailout and I was on the phone with the Fed and uh, we worked night and day to, to get that bailout done. And we know how close the system came to collapse. 2000, the dot-com crash. 2007, the mortgage market collapses. 2008, Lehman, AIG, global financial panic. I mean, how many times do these things have to happen before you can see they happen every six, seven, eight years, almost like clockwork. So just take the two things I just said and combine them. The system starts to collapse every seven or eight years. It's been eight years since the last one, and the system is exponentially riskier now than it was even eight years ago. So what's going to happen? The answer is it's going to be like something we've never seen before, and if you don't have gold, uh, your wealth is very vulnerable to getting completely wiped out. So all this is explained in my book, The New Case for Gold. It's available on Amazon. Um, I hope readers uh, get a copy, and I hope they enjoy it. James, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Thank you once again out there. Is there enough gold? To support? Yeah, there's always enough gold. That's that's a nonsense argument. And by the way, in my book, uh, The New Case for Gold, um, most of the book is devoted to explaining uh, the value of gold, reasons to have gold in a portfolio, uh, the possible gold standard, etc. But at the beginning of the book, in the introduction, I felt it was important to knock down these arguments because there's seven or eight arguments that you hear over and over again. You know, gold is a barbarous relic. There's not enough gold to support world trade and finance. The gold supply does not grow fast enough to keep up with the growth of the global economy. They're all nonsense, and I explain why in the book. But let's just, to be specific, let's take the one you mentioned, Dave, which is okay. there's not enough gold to support um, in world trade and finance. Well, there's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. Now, if you take the amount of official gold in the world at uh, $1,200 an ounce and just multiply the, the weight in ounces by $1,200, that... Uh, result is not enough to uh, to support all the money supply without severe deflationary consequences. 
But if gold were revalued to say $10,000 an ounce, the same amount of gold at $10,000 an ounce would would support a much larger uh, quantity of trade and finance very comfortably and at even higher gold prices. Um, it could do that with ease, including broader definitions of money supply, such as M2. And so the, the short answer is there's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. Now, it is true that if you want to have a gold standard to use gold as a reference in the monetary system, if you get the price wrong, it can have very severe deflationary consequences. And there was no better example of that than 1925, after World War I, when the UK wanted to go back to the gold standard, um, and the question arose, you know, Winston Churchill was the Chancellor of the Exchequer. That's actually the right way to understand it. Uh, people have a tough time uh, understanding gold. Uh, a lot of people think of it as a commodity, uh, which it really isn't. I mean, I know it trades on the commodity exchange that's included in the commodity indices, but a commodity is a, a generic input to other processes or, um, or, or products. Uh, and gold really isn't. I mean, gold is very useful as money, but it's not used for much else. People say, well, gold is used as jewelry. Sure, but jewelry is wearable wealth. When people buy a gold necklace or a gold bracelet or earrings or whatever, they think they're uh, basically buying something that will retain its value. And no better example of that than an Indian bride who is adorned in gold necklaces. But that's uh, those, those are the family savings. Uh, that's their inheritance for their children. So uh, to me, uh, ju gold jewelry is just wearable wealth, but it's still a form of wealth. And of course, coins, bars, ingots, and so forth are, are just pure wealth. So gold functions well as money. It's not good for much else, so I don't think of it as a commodity. Um, as far as an investment is concerned, I don't really think of gold as an investment. I, it does have a place in investor portfolios, as I explained in my book, The New Case for Gold, but um, it doesn't have any yield. And of course, that's often cited as a criticism, famously by Warren Buffett. He said, why would you have gold? It has no yield. Of course, Buffett's the king of tax deferred compounding. But um, gold has no yield because it's not supposed to have a yield. In other words, money has no yield because it has no risk. If you reach in your wallet or your purse and pull out a dollar bill and hold it up with both hands in front of you and say, does it have a yield? The answer is no, it has no yield at all uh, because it's not supposed to. Uh, if you have a Bitcoin, does Bitcoin have a yield? No, it's a, it's a Bitcoin. A dollar is a dollar, a Bitcoin's a Bitcoin. An ounce of gold is an ounce of gold, but none of them have yield because they're not supposed to because they're money. If you want yield, you have to take some risk. Now people say, oh, I can take my dollar and put it in the bank and get a little something, you know, not much these days, but a little bit of yield. Well, that's fine, but now it's not money anymore. Now the, the Federal Reserve will tell you it's money. They count it as the money supply. But what, when you have a bank deposit, you're really just an unsecured creditor of a private bank, which uh, as recently as 2008 were insolvent institutions. Of course, they were bailed out by the Fed. We all know that, but um, it's not risk-free. I mean, the bank could fail, and people say, well, I have deposit insurance, but for large accounts, wealthy individuals, corporations, your deposit may very well be in excess of the insured amount. Even if it isn't, the, the deposit insurance corporation itself could fail. Um, the, uh, there could be uh, a panic where they closed the banks. Uh, that happened uh, in 1933 in the United States or where they reprogram ATMs to limit you to say $300 a day in gas and groceries because who needs more than $300 a day for gas and groceries. Now, so it, um, these may be low risks. I'm not saying any of these things are going to happen tomorrow, but they're not zero risk. But, you know, the dollar bill in your wallet, the, the ounce of gold in, in a safe place, the Bitcoin in your digital wallet, those are all, uh, th those don't have any um, uh, investment risk associated with them. So, so saying gold is money um, solves a lot of problems. It, it, it's, it's also money as a unit of account. It's a way of measuring other things. Uh, and that is the best way to think about money. A lot of uh, the criticisms of gold just sort of fall down or go away once you say, well, it's not a commodity, it's not an investment, it's money, and then go from there to think about what value that might have in your portfolio. Now, there are some people that make the argument that there's not enough gold to support finance and commerce for today. Uh, there's just not enough. At the time, uh, John Maynard Keynes was uh, one of the, the exchequers and Bank of England advisors. And the question arose, well, if we go back to a strict gold standard, what should the price of gold be? And Churchill felt sort of duty bound or honor bound to go back to the pre-World War I price. The problem was the UK had double money supply to fight World War I. They basically printed a lot of money to fight the war, which is not unusual. A war of that type is an existential risk and you do what you have to do to survive. But when you double the money supply and keep the price of gold pegged, 
um, then that one of two things has to happen. You either have to, if you want to repeg at the new level, you either have to say double the price of gold or cut the money supply in half. So by going to the old price, the UK had to cut the money supply in half, which was highly deflationary. So the, the, the point is, if you have a gold standard, there's always enough gold to support it, but you have to get the price right. Today, uh, given the amount of gold in the world, given the amount of uh, money supply in the world, um, and the leverage behind that, uh, I've, I've actually done the math, and I take the reader through this in the book, the implied non-deflationary price of gold to have a gold standard today would be uh, at the low end ten thousand dollars an ounce, at the high end fifty thousand dollars an ounce. You know, the, the 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 range varies depending on what your definition of money supply. Are you going to use M zero, M one, M two? How much gold backing do you want to have? Do you want to have twenty percent, forty percent, a hundred percent? Who's going to be in the group? Is it just the United States? Is it all the major economies in the world? Those are important policy decisions, and you have to answer those questions one by one. But when you answer the questions and do the math, the range, as I said, is ten thousand to fifty thousand dollars now. So when I mention numbers like that, they're not you know made up numbers. I'm not picking a big number just to get headlines to get attention. That's the actual price you would have to have in order to have a gold standard and avoid deflation. So the short answer is, there's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. So when people say there's not enough gold, they actually don't know what they're talking about there. They haven't really thought through the problem the way I just described. Now, you mentioned $10,000 on that gold. I mean, we've seen gold drop considerably. Uh, It had a little bounce back a little while ago. Uh, And we're actually nowhere near 10,000. Why do you think it's going to reach 10,000? And when do you think it's going to reach 10,000? Well, we're nowhere near 10,000 because we're not on a gold standard and we're not using gold as a as a reference for a store of value. Now, people can do this personally. Um, I recommend to people, uh, you know, don't wait for a central banks to go on a gold standard. You can go on a personal gold standard today by allocating part of your portfolio to gold, which is a very good way to preserve wealth. Um, no, but I agree. Uh, if uh, I'm not saying that central banks have to go to a gold standard. What I am saying is that they might go to a gold standard if there's a collapse of confidence in paper money uh, in fiat currencies, which history says is just a matter of time. Uh, when I talk about the uh, the uh, collapse of the international monetary system, that's something that has happened three times in the past hundred years. It happened in 1914, it happened in 1939, it happened again in 1971. It seems to happen every 30 or 40 years. It's been uh, over 40 years since the last time. That does not mean the international monetary system will collapse tomorrow. It just means that nobody should be surprised if it does. Um, And when the international monetary system collapses, which it will, um, it doesn't mean the end of the world. It doesn't mean we all go live in caves and eat canned goods. What it does mean is that the major 